You may remember me from Eyes on Glaucoma, Eyes on 2022, and Eyes on Dry Eye. My name is Dr. Justin Schweitzer, I'm an optometrist at Vance Thompson Vision in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and I specialize in advanced surgical glaucoma care, refractive surgical care, and anterior segment pathology. I'm really excited to be coming back for Eyes on 2023, and I'm gonna be presenting a lecture called Comprehensive Refractive Surgery Pearls with my colleague and friend, Dr. Vance Thompson. Well, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Justin Schweitzer, an optometrist at Vance Thompson Vision, and really a, a honor and a pleasure to be here at Eyes On 2023. And I couldn't think of uh, someone better to give this lecture with, as you can see the title there, Comprehensive Refractive Surgery Pearls from the Experts, then you know, one of the experts uh, in not only the United States, but in the world, uh, someone that I get to spend uh, my days with on a daily basis, and I'm, I'm blessed to be able to do that with him, but uh, Dr. Vance Thompson. Vance, uh, just an honor to be able to do this with you, and thanks so much for taking the time to, to spend it with me uh, to present this lecture today. I'm, I'm excited too, and, and Justin, buddy, I could say all those words about you. It's an absolute joy and a pleasure to work with you and, and be like family. And here we get to talk to eyes on 2023. And, and uh, we got a lot of comrades out there and we get to talk about something we're both very passionate about refractive surgery and, and, and a comprehensive approach to it. These are our financial disclosures. Um, you know, Vance, we don't really need to spend a lot of time in this, but you work with plenty of the companies that really designed and, and um, implemented refractive surgery across the world. And then myself, just a few things as well. But let's just jump right into this. So when we think of the comprehensive refractive surgery 2022, some of the things that we really need to think about, you know, we've listed four things here that we, we talk to patients about on a daily basis. Do you want to have surgery on the cornea? Do we need to think about something from a standpoint of, a, of an implantable technology like a fake IOL? Is the lens the problem? And do we need to implant something uh, with the lens? Or do we do nothing? And that's something we talk about often as well. And would you say these four things kind of come up on a daily basis for you as well, Vance? They really do. And, and I think that when we talk about nothing, we're talking about you know, our respect for the most common ways to correct vision, glasses and contact lenses, still work great. But for those patients that are looking for a refractive approach, this is how we look at it, cornea, fake eye wall, or lens. Yeah, and you know, as we go through this lecture today, we're gonna to really touch on each one of these things. And, and really one of our goals today is, is to, if you're listening in, you're an optometrist out there working, you know, in a practice that makes referrals to a refractive surgery practice, having the ability to have a conversation with a patient, identify a patient that really fits into one of these buckets and letting them know, you know, boy, I think it'd be a good idea for you to consider something on the cornea, maybe LASIK, PRK, smile. Well, no, I think you'd be a better candidate for a phacic IOL. And what is that? And then finally, no, I think really your best option is to do a lens-based procedure or finally let's just stick with glasses or contact lenses. And that's a big goal of ours today. And one of the major and most important conversations that you do such a wonderful job with, Vance, is talking about, you know, this refractive endpoint and image quality. And so I'm going to turn it over to you to kind of take us through this conversation about image quality and really how important it is. And you're such a master with this conversation. So I'm excited to hear you kind of take us through it. Well, thank you, Justin. And I, I feel like, you know, when we talk about refractive surgery, um, sometimes we focus too much on refractive air. When in the end, I think what the patients really want is image quality. And so let's talk a little bit about what I mean by that. If you look at this chart and you look at the 2020 line, you can see it. But if you're the patient and you're seeing it like this, it's not the sort of vision that you're looking for. You know what the patient's looking for. And that's why we can't live and die by the Snellen chart. We need to ask the patient how they're doing with their image quality. And to tell you the truth, we need to choose refractive procedures that optimize the image quality. We all talk about uncorrected visual acuity, best corrected visual acuity, but I really like to focus on what I call uncorrected image quality, or I 
or UCIQ or best corrected image quality, BCIQ. And so, for example, I think one of the best things to ask a patient is how is your low light image quality? If I have that 52 year old and sitting in my chair and they've, you know, are minus three Dr. Mayo and they can't wear contact lenses anymore and they're ready for LASIK and they, you know, correct to 2020 and they're feeling pretty darn good about things. And I walk in and I say, okay, so if you're in a construction zone and you're driving at night and there's cars coming and it's raining, how do you feel about your image quality? When I'm done with you, if you really consider this LASIK procedure, if I hit a home run, I can help you see as good as your glasses are helping you see right now in that situation. How are you seeing? Would you be okay with that? And when they say, golly, you know, over the last 10 years, I find that situation more and more concerning. And to tell you the truth, I was hoping for better low light image quality in those situations. There's no way I'm going to be doing a corneal refractive surgery on that patient. It's nothing. And then someday a lens-based procedure, whether it's in a month, five years, or 10 years. I call low light image quality the poor man's wavefront. And it's a neat way to understand really how their optical system is functioning with the best optical devices. Is that low light image quality good? Well, then I can start to take for granted that their tear film, their epithelium, their stroma is probably pretty good. And to tell you the truth, their lens is probably pretty darn good. I can start thinking about a corneal refractive procedure in a patient that satisfies these criteria. But if the nighttime image quality is poor, I'm starting to get suspicious about that lens. Of course, I'm gonna be ruling out the tear film as a issue or the epithelium or the anterior stroma. But if I got poor low light image quality, there's no way I'm gonna be doing uh, a corneal refractive or since we only do fake a guy while in patients under the age of 40, if they have poor low light image quality, I'm not gonna be doing a fake a guy well either. So we need to be what I call a private investigator, but in reality, I like this even better, a private image quality investigator and just rolls right off the tongue. And we have ways now to quantify our optical system that we didn't have years ago. When we can look at the high order aberrations of someone's cornea and actually quantify them and be able to see like in a patient like this, that that's a relatively clean cornea and compare it to a patient like this, who has 1.258 RMS and really a lot of corneal irregularities, we don't have to guess. We have ways to quantify it. And so I love modern day technology, but still nothing to me <laughs> replaces what I'm about ready to say. And that is, I still think the four opter is one of the most important things ever invented. And asking that patient when they see the 2020 line, how is your image quality. And if it's not good, and I am worried about the tear film epithelium or stroma, I'm putting on a gas permeable contact lens. So for example, the patient's looking at this chart and we've done a four opter refraction and they're just feeling like it's not that sharp. And then I put the gas perm contact on and boom, it pops to that sharp 2020 with a beautiful over refraction, I know there's something going on on the surface. I don't know if it's tear film. I don't know if it's epithelium. I don't know if it's stroma, but I have ways that I can look at this. And anymore, I you know, feel like every patient is guilty until proven innocent with regards to their tear film, because we all know how important that air tear interface is, the most powerful, focusing element of our eye, and we really want to analyze it. And to tell you the truth, we consider it an important part of our screening. And so, Justin, I don't know about you, but, you know, we've been epithelial mapping now for about five years. And I'm telling you, I think it's one of the most important treatments that, I mean, the most, one of the most important diagnostics, you know, not only for, you know, 
really not care to call on us, but trying to figure out enhancements. How about you? Yeah, no, great technology. And, you know, I, I just wanted to comment on that last section because the way that you talk about it and, and it, it, it's so important and, and brilliant, really, because we think about it like my, my optometrists out there right now that are, you know, trying to decide, boy, is this patient a good candidate for refractive surgery? Should I send it, you know, to Vance to have a, a procedure done? Really what you showed us is you don't need to have all the best technology in the world. Now we love the best technology in the world, but what you just showed us was that you really just need to ask a few questions, your image quality, uh, maybe do a little tear film assessment. And I always say, you don't need to have all the bells and whistles for tear film assessment. You know, a questionnaire is one thing I really like. Some vital dyes to be able to stay in the cornea to look for that. A thumb, uh, most of us have a thumb to be able to look at the mybum and a slit lamp to be able to look for that staining to have patients look down to look for blepharitis. So we're not talking about investing in a bunch of technology, but you're talking about image quality, RGP contact lens, refracting, you know, something that all of us as optometrists do on a consistent basis, and then just making sure the tear film is healthy. And so I just wanted to point out that everything you just talked about there isn't investing in $100,000 equipment. It's really stuff we have in our practice right now that we can identify good patients for corneal refractive procedures. So I I'm sorry got us off track a little bit, and I know we we're going to talk about phileo mapping, but I wanted to just comment on that before we got into this. I, I think we need t-shirts that say, my thumb, my bum. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> and now I'm going to on it right now, Vance. I'm, we're talking about that after we're done with this lecture. <laughs> <laughs> well, you started it. <laughs> <laughs> I just twisted it. So epithelial mapping, though, to me, though, is literally one of the most important tests that we do uh, in, in evaluation and, and to tell you the truth, in refractive and cataract. Um, and how about you, buddy? Yeah, definitely a, a, a crucial technology. When we think of the epithelium, you know, on average, it's about 53 microns or so, plus or minus, you know, three, four microns either direction. But it's in the decision making on whether or not we should do something like PRK versus LASIK. And we're going to get to a case here in a few minutes. Uh, and, and really, you're going to take us through that case of would you do, you know, PRK on a patient or would you do LASIK on a patient? You know, um, I think the other important thing is as we're talking refractive surgery is to just realize this lens that sometimes it's hard on a slit lamp exam to, to really understand if the lens is really affecting their vision. And, and so this journey through lenticular aging, I think we're identifying at an earlier and earlier age that the lens is the issue. And we'll be talking about implants a little bit towards the end, but I think it's important to also realize that if we identify the lens as the issue at an earlier age, there's a couple things that are real important issues in refractive surgery. One, we don't want to do something that doesn't involve replacing that lens that is affecting their image quality. We don't want to do corneal refractive or a phacic IOL. But what's also happening when we're removing that lens at an earlier age is we're removing accommodation. And, you know, yes, the, our, our ability to flex our lens has lessened as we get into our 50s, but we have other things that's helping us with depth of focus or pseudo accommodation. Sometimes that early lens aging that's affecting low light image quality can help bright light reading, almost like an extended depth of focus implant. And if we identify it as a culprit and we replace that fuzzy lens with a monofocal implant. And we really haven't talked with our patients about a multifocal implant. We're really giving that patient what I like to call absolute presbyopia for the rest of their life. And these patients really need to be told about, yes, we can improve your image quality, but we could potentially hurt your accommodative range. And there's technologies that can help that. And we'll be talking about those in a little bit. So analyzing the lens is just so important. Well, should we get into talking about the cornea, Justin? 
it's the fun stuff here. It's all fun, but this is going to be a fun part. And I think, uh, you know, the way we like to think about it is when it comes to PRK, LASIK, SMILE, since we were involved in all three FDA monitored trials over the years, we do all three. And every patient that's a candidate for corneal refractive, we're thinking about, yes, their vision, but also the optics of the procedure, what it's going to do to corneal bi biomechanics, what it's going to do to corneal sensation, and are there any dry eye issues? You like that approach too, Justin? Love that approach. I think those are all things you mentioned that if we don't take into account um, on the back end after a procedure is done, uh, we may have a disappointed, disappointed patient, even if the procedure goes beautifully and they're seeing 2020, 2015, uh, if those things aren't taken into account, like you mentioned, you know, we, we could have a patient that's just not fully satisfied. Yeah. And so as we think about these things, uh, you know, PRK being the first procedure, I mean, we literally started our PRK research here in Sioux Falls before you know, we ever heard of LASIK. You know, this was, you know, 19, you know, 91, and it was very early. And it, we still, to this day, in a patient who is a good candidate for corneal refractive, but doesn't have enough thickness to their cornea, will still consider PRK. What are some of the other reasons, Justin, you think, you, you suggest PRK? You know, I, at times we'll do it in a patient that has some dryness that I'm worried a lot about a little bit of dryness where we don't want to, you know, create a flap. And I know you're going to talk about some corneal sensitivity here in a little bit where we maybe don't want to sever any nerves. So I, I think a PRK there, I think a PRK in these, in these low prescriptions as well. And then, you know, athletes sometimes contact, you know, sport athletes. If I'm worried about a flap issue that could occur, it's rare, but we think about it. And then military people as well. I sometimes think about it as well. I have a conversation with them about it. Or I'm worried maybe about a, a flat complication that could occur. Again, rare, but still a conversation that I feel like I need to have. Yeah, I feel the same way. And I think that ABMD is a special situation because, you know, I remember when we first started doing PRK, we, you know, also were involved in the PTK trials. Actually, I was the medical monitor for our country for the first PTK trial. And, and it was exciting to have a way to reestablish a more normal uh, epithelium and to improve patients' vision who had, you know, um, uh, map dot fingerprint dystrophy. So sometimes we look at PRK as a way to, to treat both. And I think it's so important that we make sure that the best corrected image quality is really good and then map the epithelium and make sure it's not too irregular. Because we have, we have a 70 micron thick epithelium on this side of the pupil and 50 on this side of the pupil, that PRK is not going to be as accurate as someone with that nice same thickness epithelium. And so we use epithelial mapping to help us make a decision on ABMD. Should we first in a real irregular epithelium treat the epithelium with the PTK, let them heal for three to five months, come back with a more normal epithelium and then make that final refractive decision? Um, or is the ABMD mild enough that we feel like our refractive endpoints are accurate? So let's go ahead and kind of do a combination treatment. The actual PRK will help reestablish a more normal adherence of the epithelium. So Justin, you want to talk about the post-op course? Yeah, you bet. So, you know, PRK postoperatively, when you manage a few of these, you'll, you'll definitely become more comfortable with that. And really, when we look at this, I kind of broke it down from day one to day five, and then up to a month and then beyond. And that day one to day five is more just education, uh, reminding the patient that they're going to be a bit uncomfortable. Of course, the epithelium has been, has been removed at this point in time, and there's a bandage contact that's been in place. So you want to identify, make sure that's there as well. They're going to be sensitive to light. There's going to be some tearing. And, just a reminder that there's some fluctuation in vision and then a reminder to continue using their post-operative medications. And so day one through five is just a lot of hand-holding. And we would expect by day four or five, typically by day four, that that, that epithelium is going to heal. And that's really where we get them back and we, we consider, you know, removal of the bandage contact lens. 
So what would you expect to see when you remove that bandage contact lens? Remember the epithelium typically heals from outside in. And so a lot of times you may see a small epithelial ridge. That's very normal, but that can affect patient's vision. And it's not uncommon for a patient to say, boy, I actually was seeing better on day two and now I'm seeing worse on day four or five when I'm in your clinic. Why is that happening? And a lot of times it's happening because of that small epithelial ridge that can be there. You may see a patient that has a little bit of haziness in their vision. That's quite common. You want to educate them not to rub their eyes. And then I think the biggest thing for me to remind patients of in this kind of day um, five when I'm removing that bandage contact is that your vision is not going to be likely ideal until probably a month. And it may even take out to four months before you come in here and want to give us a hug and say, boy, I really, really am happy that I did this. That's not uncommon. And so that's a big point to keep in mind because patients at times they'll talk to friends that may have undergone some other refractive corneal procedure. And they're like, boy, by day one or week one, I was seeing amazing. And that's just not always the case with PRK. I think I, the uh, other, oh, go ahead. Oh, Vance. Go ahead. No, you go ahead, buddy. <laughs> I think I was just the other comment I was going to make and, and um, is, is, you know, the, the non-healing situation, because I think that that scares us this time as optometrists, when a patient comes in and we're ready to move that bandage contact lens and that, that epithelium may not have healed fully. Uh, I think it's important. We want that epithelium to heal within that first four to five days, even that first week, because there's a little higher risk of, of haze that could occur if that doesn't happen. So what do you do in those situations? Well, I'm a huge fan of placing punctal plugs in those situations. I'm a big fan of upping their artificial tears, uh, maybe replacing that bandage contact lens, doing everything I can to promote epithelial healing. And so I'll even back down the steroid as well at that particular visit if that epithelium isn't healing. So for me, it involves plugging, backing the steroid off, increasing artificial tears, and that typically will do the job to finish up that, that healing process. Um, I, I, I find it interesting that you and I were both jumping at the same topic because it's so important to us. I consider it, um, if, if I may not call it an emergency, but it's going to become one if you don't take care of this urgency. If the epithelium is not healed by day five, a delayed you know, healing of an epithelium, you can start to you know, release hydrolytic enzymes. And the last thing you want is, like what Justin said, haze. But you can even have, you know, subtle stromal melts with epithelial defects that aren't healing. And I will even ask patients if they're using a ceiling fan. Uh, I think ceiling fans are horrible for uh, epithelium. Um, sometimes if I suspect that they're rubbing their eyes at night, I'll have them wear a shield. And if they tell me they woke up in the morning with the shield on the floor, I even have them get swimmer's goggles or something. I happen to love swimmer's goggles because they keep water out for swimmers and they keep moisture in for dry eye patients. And so sometimes to take the football into the end zone, doing the things that Justin talked about, in addition to some of these things, super important to get that epithelium to heal. And it otherwise increases the risk of this. And this is something that when we first started PRK using broad beam lasers with 6.5 millimeter diameter beams that were controlled by an iris diaphragm, we would see actually little steps in the stroma. And it actually worked quite well, but there was a higher risk of haze. When we, you know, in the late 90s, transitioned to 0 0.8, 0 0.9 millimeter diameter Gaussian shaped beams that were scanned in a way that overlap was perfect. It led to just such smooth ablations that haze became way less of an issue. And so, so much less of an issue that sometimes it's forgotten about. So in situations where someone's had previous, you know, LASIK or previous smile. Sometimes doctors forget that PRK over previous refractive surgery has a higher chance of haze. Mitomycin has helped a lot, but we still need to inform our patients of this chance and optimize the, you know, ocular environment so that there's not a dry eye issue in combination with the fact that we're doing PRK over previous corneal surgery or something we really want to have a happy tear film. I think it's the most important part of, you know, corneal refractive surgery. 
So we had a nice conversation around PRK, but obviously there's other corneal refractive procedures that, that many of us are familiar with. And so we're going to talk a little bit about LASIK versus SMILE. And we put LASIK versus SMILE because there are advantages of both and there's some disadvantages to both. And at times there's certain patient candidates that fit better for LASIK. There's certain patient candidates that maybe fit a bit better for SMILE. And so Vance, I'll be kind of take us away and let's go through kind of the advantages, disadvantages of, of these two procedures. Okay, wonderful. Well, you know, what, how I feel about it is, you know, it's, it's kind of a smile brings what we love about PRK, no flap, uh, together with what we love about LASIK, faster vision return and less pain. So I think one of the main reasons it's been the fastest growing corneal refractive procedure in our world over the last decade is because of that. But there's some other things too that are real nice with SMILE um, that we're gonna talk about, such as less dry eye, and let's talk a little bit about biomechanics. Because one of the things with SMILE is that the side cut is just a lot smaller. That incision, and when we talk about biomechanics, we can see LASIK has a large side cut and SMILE has a very small one. And as a result, people feel that the biomechanical stability of the cornea is better after SMILE. And there's been some important studies that have shown this in both computer modeling and also in some you know, post-operative testing, but it's still what we would call equivocal. Some, some beautiful studies hinting towards SMILE being better uh, as far, with regards to biomechanics, but I think that the fact of the matter is that none of us feel that we're prepared to say, okay, someone's not a candidate for LASIK, they are a candidate for SMILE. I think right now we still feel for lamellar corneal surgery, it's the same criteria to be a good LASIK candidate biomechanically or corneal thickness um, as it is a smile. And maybe with time, we'll be able to prove it differently, but you'll find most surgeons in the world kind of choosing the same patient selection when it comes to uh, their cornea and corneal thickness. Now, there's other reasons that smile starts to be something patients are very interested in. One of them is this. We know that corneal sensation is reduced less with smile and recovers more quickly. Makes sense that we're cutting less corneal nerves. And you can see in this study comparing LASIK on top with smile on the bottom, that there's a much quicker recovery of the subbasal nerve length and density with smile. And as a result, it makes sense that there's less dry eye after smile. And pretty much every test you can do will show that there's less dry eye. So if a patient's real concerned about dry eye after LASIK or they have dry eye issues, smile can be a real positive for those patients. If we look at vision, typically the uncorrected results after SMILE in someone who's a, a good candidate, and we'll talk about that in just a little bit, are very comparable to the results after LASIK. And this shows numerous clinical trials, the uh, eye design, the Alcon Contura, and the you know, sphero cylinder SMILE procedure. They, they all are quite comparable. So as far as vision, and that's why I always say we got to think about more than vision. But one of the most important things with SMILE is that we center it well. And with LASIK, we're also using a femtosecond laser to make the flap, and we try to center it well, but if it's not centered perfectly, once we lift that flap, we're going to center the eczema laser perfectly. With SMILE, every now and then we have a situation where we can't center that femtosecond laser perfectly. And we're doing the whole procedure with the femtosecond laser. And that's why centration is so important. 
there's some great advancements happening in SMILE uh, with regards to centration. Um, and, and eventually, I think it's going to be less of an issue because tracking in PRK and LASIK was so helpful. We're starting to see tracking enter SMILE, and that will be helpful. So, Justin, you know, now let's say we have a patient where their manifest refraction and their topographic cylinder just doesn't match up. We know we can do pretty darn good with, you know, um, wavefront optimized and wavefront guided uh, PRK and LASIK, but we're hearing more and more about topo guided. What do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, it's it's um, it's been a learning curve, but you look at the data around, and I know you're going to touch on a little bit about this. And, you know, we know LASIK does a, a great job of providing, you know, really good image quality, 2020, 2015 vision. Well, and that's why I think it's so important for, for everyone to realize, you know, we have, you know, wavefront guided, we have wavefront optimized, and we have topo guided, and we're even getting into ray tracing, and the ablations are just getting more and more refined. And topo guided has been actually a rather complicated, you know, surgical planning process until the Forcity software that Mark Lobanoff developed that really was able to combine the vectors of the anterior corneal astigmatism. Um, what's called the talus astigmatism, or that major astigmatism topographically, the posterior corneal astigmatism, and lenticular astigmatism. There's a lot going on there, and it has just simplified the planning process so much. And this was a trial that really turned a lot of heads, where 51 eyes that had a pretty impressive difference between manifest refraction and topographic cylinder, and the um, approach was a topographic guided approach and look at the amount of eyes that were 2020. And that's why a lot of people consider this approaching the most accurate procedure in the world, a very quality performed topo guided corneal refractive surgery, whether it's PRK or LASIK. And so where we feel that LASIK wins is when patient fixation is you know, unimpeded, um, boy, uh, the, the tracking uh, uh, of, of, of a human eye is just so impressive. And then top, if, if a patient needs topo-guided topo surgery, you can't do that with SMILE yet. And if they need wavefront-guided, they have high-order aberrations that need to be treated, um, we would lean towards a wavefront-guided LASIK procedure. And if they have low cylinders, since SMILE is approved for 0.75 and up of astigmatism to three diopters, if they have 0.5 and it's visually significant, we're going to be looking at PRK or LASIK. Yeah. And we do think about those with low corrections. And so SMILE wins where the correction is high enough, and, and, and you can see the FDA label right there, where dry eye is a concern, and when topo-guided or wavefront-guided uh, isn't needed. And to, you know, to tell you the truth, in, in, in this modern day age of corneal refractive surgery, there's a lot of patients that qualify for SMILE. And if they do, because I said if they qualify for SMILE, they also qualify for LASIK. But SMILE would be my preferred approach if they don't need wavefront guided or topo guided. So we see SMILE growing in our practice. And when we look at this comprehensive approach uh, to refractive surgery, we also talk about fake guy wells. And Justin, you want to kind of run us through that a little bit? Yeah, you bet. For me, fake guy wells are one of the most life-changing uh, procedures that I think you know we do. It's a foldable device, so there's a smaller incision. We're going to talk about another technology here with a larger um, incision that needs to be done. Uh, it is posterior chamber, as I mentioned, in between the iris and, and the, the natural lens. Uh, you can correct astigmatism with this as well. So that technology is available and the sizing really is critical with this particular technology. And so we really look at the anterior chamber depth. You need to have roughly a 2.8 millimeter anterior chamber depth or greater uh, to be able to do this. And then for me, postoperatively, when I'm looking at this, I wanna see a space between 
the implant and the natural lens. The last thing I want to see is this lens kind of slammed up or close to that particular uh, that 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 natural lens. And so I'm looking for at least 100 microns in the minimum. I'm I'm okay seeing up to 400 microns, but for me that kind of sweet spot is somewhere between 250 and 300 microns. Anything you want to add to that, Vance? Um, well, you know, I think that fake eye walls are just a beautiful way to bridge the gap between that moment in time that the patient does it to someday cataract surgery. Because as we know, high myopes get cataracts at a younger age. And when you see a 10 doctor LASIK from 10 years ago come in and it's time for a cataract consultation, a lot of these beautiful implants that have been developed to extend depth of focus or multifocality, we all know that cornea plus lens equals vision. And if their cornea has been altered a lot, it starts to rule out a lot of modern day pseudophagic implants for that cataract patient. So one of the things I love about phagic IOLs is it preserves that corneal curvature in the optics of the cornea so they have all those lens options someday. And I wanna emphasize the yearly exams. We really wanna follow the corneal endothelium. I've wanted to start a society called the Society for ruling out eye rubbing. I just think eye rubbing is such an issue, whether it's causing keratoconus or other problems with the eyes, but you can also find it in some of these fake IOL wearers. And we have a long talk with them. If you can't stop eye rubbing, you shouldn't do this, but it's still important to follow them because sometimes they're face planting into a pillow and we wanna know what's happening with that corneal endothelium over time. And I think the other thing I wanted to mention is having been in the FDA monitored trials for this lens, most recently the EVO lens that has the hole right in the center that's been in the rest of the world for quite some time, what it's done is helped us not need a peripheral iridectomy anymore. And it's been a really big advance. As a matter of fact, when I do an EVO lens in one eye and it's time for the second eye, I call that second one the EVO twin. And it's a great way to correct high myopia. And we've had wonderful results with phacic IOLs. The Verisys comes in quite high powers, but it involves using a larger incision. And this is an implant that is FDA approved in our country also, and can treat very high levels of myopia and attaches to the iris in what a process we call enclavation, but you need a peripheral iridectomy with this lens. But as you can tell with phacic IOLs, we really like that it preserves the cornea for someday a lens-based surgery. Justin, should we kind of take the football in for the touchdown talking about lens-based surgery? And, you know, I think one of the things that we wanted to talk about was uh, basically the light adjustable lens. And do you want to talk a little bit about that, buddy? This lens, you know, has been uh, so fun to work with. When I think about precision, I think about the light adjustable lens. If I want a patient to have precise distance vision, which is all of them, or I have a patient that wants to have precise distance vision, uh, this is that lens because we have the ability after it's been implanted to make adjustments to it. And so if there's a little bit of residual refractive error or a little bit of residual astigmatism afterwards, we're going to be able to fine tune that. And the way that this particular lens works is it has these rel regular silicone monomers, and then it has these mobile silicone subunits that are called macromers, and they're photosensitive. So Vance will do the surgery. He'll put this implant in after the implant's been placed. We will see the patient about a month later, roughly. And we're able to do an adjustment of any of those residual refractive errors that exist. And there's a device that delivers light to the implant that just changes the radius of curvature. And we're able to do three adjustments. And then you lock this particular implant in. And the precision of it is so great. And at times you may want to give a patient really good distance vision in both eyes. We may offset the eye slightly to give a little bit of mini monovision. But the beauty of that is we can show the patient on each adjustment of what they're getting or what they're achieving. And so it's been a really fun lens in our practice to be able to utilize, to give this kind of precise vision, but also have the adjustability to it as well. 
You know, I tell patients, I actually teach them about effective lens position. And the way I start out is I talk about with reading glasses, you know, they're calibrated to be 12, 13 millimeters from your cornea so that when you're, you blink, your eyelashes don't hit them. But you see people who allow them to go down their nose and those reading glasses actually become stronger. Even though they still say two power, they become stronger. And I say, patient, when you put them out here, you're starting to make a pair of binoculars. And so the distance of the lens, and I don't use nodal point, but I do say the distance of the lens from your pupil matters. Well, now we're getting ready to work on this lens behind your pupil. And when you were 10 years old, it was this thin. And now it's this thick. And we're gonna take the cataract out of this capsule and your new lens is gonna sit in the same capsule, but it's as thin as a 10 year old's lens and we're gonna calculate it that it's gonna sit in the middle. And if it does, it's probably gonna be pretty darn accurate. But if it doesn't, if it sits in the back or the front, it changes its whole power. And you combine that with the fact that the incision can change astigmatism. It's not unusual for you and me to look at each other patient at three weeks post-op and say, I wish I knew that about your healing, I'd have put in a different power. Well, the whole beauty of this lens is that the only lens on Mother Earth that's customizable inside your eye, and that's why it's the world's most accurate lens with no close second. And the final thing I'll say about the light adjustable lens is I like to separate premium cataract surgery implants where patients are trying to do a lot without glasses and minimize refractive error. I like to separate them into optic adjustable and cornea adjustable because the rest of the implants we'll be talking about, if you have significant refractive error, you can't adjust their power and you need to do a PRK or a LASIK or astigmatic keratotomy to take the football in for the touchdown. Well, there's a lot of corneas out there that we don't wanna do more surgery on. For instance, maybe it's post-refractive or they've had some other issue. And so doing an optic adjustable implant really fits for those patients. And when you can get 94.5% within a half diopter of Plano, you can just see the advancement in accuracy with this technology. Trifocality, Justin, what do you think? Yeah, this has been, you know, a huge, you know, advantage and in, in, in I would argue game changer for us in, in not only cataract surgery, but even with refractive lens exchanges and when the lens is becoming part of the concern, because now we're able to give patients distance, intermediate and near and good visual quality. We're getting as close as possible to what their natural lens behaved like when they were younger. Now it's still not perfect, but it's, it's close. And you still have to have the conversation about glare and halos with this type of technology, but this is a technology that will 90% of the time, or I tell patients 90% of the things you're going to do, you're probably going to do without glasses. You're going to be able to do a lot of things you want to do up close, and you can do a lot of things you want to do at distance without glasses. And we can almost achieve, you know, 100% reduction of, of your eyewear, but not quite 100%. Well, and I agree. And if, to tell you the truth, you know, here we were involved in the FDA monitor trials of, you know, corneal refractive surgery, fake eye wells, and, you know, all the trifocals. And I have to tell you, you know, over the last 20 years, my use of multifocality went from about, you know, zero <laughs> to 40% of my cataract patients choosing it. And it was in some of these FDA monitored trials where we saw such high patient satisfaction. And anymore, we know that with the beautiful optics in these trifocals that the most frustrating cause of blur for a patient is the same as in PRK, LASIK and SMILE, and that is residual refractive error. And, and that's why I tell patients, if you don't get to that 2020, because we're gonna do all the math and surgery to get you to 2020, but if you're not near zero correction, it's very common to need a refractive enhancement. And it's also common to need a YAG laser capsulotomy because these beautiful optics that are extending depth of focus and, and, and providing a very regular scientific form of multifocality are really degraded 
by irregular forms of multifocality. And that's why I tell patients for the ideal trifocal experience, it's oftentimes three steps plus time. And I will tell them that first, you know, four to six months is spent optimizing the image quality with the fancy implant, the laser fine tune, YAG laser capsulotomy. And then the second six months is spent your brain getting used to your new optical system through neural adaptation. And that the happiest patients are in that eight month to 12 month time period. And if you're ready for that journey at the end of it, you'll have some of the world's most advanced optics in your eyes with a very high rate of patient satisfaction. What do you think, Justin? Couldn't agree more with you and technologies aren't stopping, right? There's more coming. This particular lens is, is, is FD approved and, and going to be in our hands very soon and being utilized for a variety of different situations. And, you know, we look at the different options where we can consider this. This is, you know, a small aperture lens, really focus on the depth of focus. So it's only placed in the non-dominant eye. And this can be used to normalize. It can be used in these post-refractive eyes and, and a powerful tool to not only provide a little bit of up close vision and, and a fair amount of up close vision, but not degrade distance vision as well. So excited to get this uh, rolling as well in our particular practice. Well, we've talked a lot about a lot of things in regards to refractive surgery, but I would love it if you could take us home with this kind of 10 point checklist that, that you've put together, um, you know, looking at refractive surgery and we're saying 2022, but this will carry right over into 2023 as well. Yes, and what a pleasure this has been doing with you. And, you know, these things about refractive surgery, let's cover each one of these 10 things. I just really am passionate about this issue of eye rubbing and asking every single patient. It's such a common cause of keratoconus and investing in modern day diagnostics. It's amazing what tear film analysis, topography, mapping the epithelium, looking at corneal HOAs and macular OCT do for things like even premium cataract surgery. Remember, dry eye, guilty until proven innocent. The tear film with over 2000 proteins is the most powerful anti-inflammatory. It's antibacterial. It, yes, carries oxygen and it moisturizes the eye, but it's the most powerful focusing on one of the eye, the air tear interface. And therapeutically and optically, we want to have it be wonderful. We want to educate all patients on their non-surgical and surgical options. Don't have them find out about a modern day option post-operatively when they're reading in the lay press. And, and then respect image quality and refractive endpoint. Utilize gas perm over refractions and respect low refractive error. If you have that multifocal patient who's 2025 and they have a refractive error of, you know, plano minus 0.75 axis 180, even though they're seeing the 2020 line, if just show them what that refractive error, what an enhancement could do for them. And if they don't mind a pair of glasses for when they want things sharp, that's fine too. Just show them those low levels of refractive error and get to know them well enough to what I call the, if I were you, recommendation. That means you get to know them and they get to know as much about their options as possible because then you can say, if I you know, were you, I would consider this option. And it's just such a beautiful way to make a recommendation, getting to know each other. And if I tell surgeons, if you do their best option, do it well. If you don't do their best option, refer them on. Continue to learn, keep your skills up, exercise self-awareness and do quality surgery. For instance, during laser vision, I'm amazed how many calls I get about left eye overcorrections. And then I'll ask, do you make sure and close the left eye while you're doing the right eye PRK or LASIK or smile? And they're like, well, I actually don't. Well, these patients sit there with their eye open, concentrating the cornea is dehydrating. The laser doesn't know that. So it's removing more microns per pulse Get to know these things and, and, and center your capsular excess and implant based on the Purkinje images and finish the refractive job you started with an attention to both image quality and refractive goal. Don't trust a refraction where the best corrected image quality is reduced. Treat the cause of the best corrected image quality reduction. And then when you can show them with that four opter a sharp image, then go after the refractive error. 
And then finally, take care of your unhappy patients, demystify their situation so they're not so intimidated and they can understand that the golden rule, do for others what you would do for yourself or a loved one. Man, it's just an honor and a pleasure to be able to do this with you. Thanks for your time and, and being a part of, of Eyes on 2023 with me. Thank you so much, Justin. I really enjoyed, enjoyed this so much. And Eyes on 2023, bravo on your success and the amount of people around the world watching you. And what an honor to be a part of it. Thank you so much. Well, thanks, everyone. And thank you, Vance and Justin, sharing your real-world approach to refractive surgery care. What I really want to do is take away a couple of points here. I really love the UCIQ and VCIQ concept of uncorrected image quality and best corrected image quality because they just, it really resonated with me in, in, in practice as to how that actually applies when you take into account patient's vision. So the other takeaway is never underestimating the importance of the ocular surface when you're taking into consideration once more, again, these different refractive surgery procedures. So hopefully everyone can agree that we learned some new tips and tricks from these two experts to take into practice on Monday morning. And before we conclude this session, I know you're all excited. Here's the next raffle code. It is SMILE, S-M-I-L-E, SMILE. Thank you.